businesses, institutions, individuals, and uh, we all focus on amplifying in different areas, uh, but with um, the uh, priority areas of economic opportunity, civic engagement, and leadership representation. So that's who we are, and if you don't know our organization, if you are new to Amplify, please look us up on uh, our website, and also follow us on social media. Uh, we are uh, providing you with our social media handles here. Uh, give us a shout out today uh, because we are live on Facebook. Uh, but also, please follow our guests. Our speakers are amazing and they are our amplifiers. So we create this platform not only to talk about these uh, topics, but also to highlight our Latinx leaders. So um, to go over logistics today, um, I want to make sure that we are on the same page. I know that we now like zoomed out and we know all the ins and outs of Zoom at this point, but I just want to make sure that we are following the logistics uh, for this um, conversation today. Uh, throughout the conversation, we're just going to ask you to be muted um, so we can allow time for uh, our guest speaker to present some information and, uh, and then we can open it up for discussion. Uh, and that's your opportunity to share anything that you want to share, reactions, questions, um, or any other information. Also, I mentioned that we are live on Facebook. So I just wanted to let you know that. And uh, if you can um, let uh, others know that they can join us um, and follow us on this conversation today. Um, if anything comes up uh, that you wanna hear throughout the discussion, please feel free to use the Q&A box uh, on your menu. Um, just share anything there and then we refer to that uh, when we are on the Q&A uh, section of this discussion. Also, this uh, um, conversation is being recorded and we're gonna provide you with a recording uh, in our, our thank you email that we're gonna send after, after the session. And this will also include some resources and other information, as well as a, a sh very short survey uh, where, where you can let us know um, how you felt about the, the session, if there are any other topics that you want us to discuss and just give us some feedback so we can continue improving this programming. So now with that said, um, I want to um, introduce our speaker today. And I'm just like super excited, not only because I'm getting to know Dr. Mariel Novas, but uh, also because I just am following her uh, career and she's a passionate, a passionate educator and an inspirational woman. And um, the more I know and the more I speak, spend time with Marielle, I'm just more excited about seeing her growth in her career and all the amazing things that she is doing. Um, so I, that's why I was very excited about having her coming on today to our Cafecitos. Uh, Marielle is the Assistant Director of Partnerships and Engagement for Massachusetts at the Education Trust. And she's gonna tell you more about that and her work uh, under that organization. But what I can tell you is Marielle believes in expanding opportunities for historically marginalized students, families, and communities. And, and that's huge, um, you know, um, taking over all of that, but she's doing an amazing work. Um, and I just cannot wait to, to have this discussion with her today. Uh, again, the topic of today's uh, conversation is healing and movement building for educational equity. And uh, I just want to introduce the topic by saying that, you know, bringing attention to the reality of our communities right now. We are uh, the uh, killings of George Floyd right now. Um, uh, we just follow seeing, you know, the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia and Breonna Taylor in Kentucky. Uh, these incidents of uh, police uh, brutality and violence continue to make more visible in uh, the systems of, um, you know, systemic ras racism in our communities, oppression, uh, inequality, um, and, you know, the, the uh, issues that we've been facing historically as communities of color that have been, you know, uh, healing our nation uh, historically. So uh, before we continue with this conversation today, I want to take a moment of silence in the memory of all of those individuals that I mentioned, but also the hundreds 
hundreds and hundreds of others that through our history have suffered from this systemic racism and oppression in our nation. And that we are not mentioning, that we are not saying their names, but we know that um, you know, they also have suffered through this. So I wanna take a moment of silence for that. Thank you. I also want to say that um, not only me individually, um, as, a, as a woman of color in, in, um, in the United States right now, but also um, in representing Amplify Latinx and uh, other groups in our communities, uh, we stand in solidarity in our demands for justice. And we call upon each of you to work together to drive change. So this is so important to have these conversations right now. As uh, black and brown people, we are turning to the streets uh, to protest uh, the brutality that we're seeing, but also, you know, we are living in a backdrop of um, disparity in our communities. Um, disparity that has been devastating our very own black and, and brown communities for um, years. Uh, we have COVID-19 that continues to affect us uh, disproportionately. And we have been seeing this loud and clear right now, uh, thanks to video and technology that puts these feeds in our faces uh, by the minute. So we wanted to create safe spaces and inclusive spaces where we can have these conversations and really be honest about the way we are feeling um, about what's happening um, on a daily basis, uh, how we're feeling um, individually as human beings, but also in our communities, um, and how we can just you know have a space where we can mourn, but also share pain and anger um, as we continue to heal, because all of those things are very real. So uh, with that said, <laughs> I do want to welcome uh, Dr. Mariel Novas because she can bring such a, an interesting perspective into this conversation. So Mariel, I want to open up the floor to you so you can introduce yourself and, and uh, we can start um, talking about this topic today. Gracias, Rosario. Um, of all the people in the world, I'm really glad I'm, I'm having this hour with you as two Afro-Latinas to be having this conversation in this moment, I think that's incredibly important. So thank you so much to Amplify for inviting me to be part of this conversation and to be able to share a little bit about myself, my work and sort of where I'm at right now. Um, in the spirit of the theme of the conversation, which is healing, uh, a lot of my healing uh, in the moment consists of being honest with myself and with those around me about how I am and where I am, how my heart is doing. So. In the spirit of that, allow me to share with this room of strangers and friends that I woke up this morning just not feeling great. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in that place and I'm trying to uh, honor um, the lives of those that we've lost, not just in our recent history as you named, but throughout time and over time senselessly. Uh, and so it, it's, it's really an honor to be here with you all and to form community with you all. So a little bit about me. Um, those of you who know me uh, know that the first thing I always say, I'm, I'm Dominican. <laughs> so I was born in the Dominican Republic and I moved to Boston with my family in 1993 when I was five years old. I spent half my life in the Boston public schools and then received a scholarship to attend private school outside of Boston for the second half of my K-12 experience. And I named that because that has informed a lot of how I see the world. Um, being on a bus that takes you on the 23 or the 15 or the 28 from Roxbury um, onto Dudley, onto Ruggles, take a, a train to get to Forest Hill to then take a carpool to take you out to Dedham, that was my lived experience for six years. And so noticing and living that disparity for me has informed a lot of how I understand what it means to have and what it means to not have. Um, I remember often the bus route through Malcolm X Boulevard uh, in Roxbury, where as those of you who are familiar with the Boston context know that that, uh, that boulevard there uh, contains the Timothy Middle School, Madison Park, 
the John D. O'Brien, so a ton of schools. Um, I'd be on the bus with a whole bunch of kids that look like me um, and would be packed in like sardines. And then the doors would open, the bus would empty out, and I was often the only one left on the bus, maybe with like one or two adults. Um, and that sounds simple enough, but that was a scene that presented a lot of pain for me growing up, knowing that I was both being kind of plucked out of my community and that I was alone. Um, and so that sort of feeling of loneliness um, has been something that I've carried with me for a long time. And so the idea of building people power and building community has honestly been my saving grace. Uh, it's been where I have found my power again, where I have found my voice, and where I've been able to remain really rooted and connected to my community. So once I graduated college, I was the first in my family to go to college in this country. I went to Yale and graduated in 2010. I felt in my heart that I needed to come back to my community. Uh, I needed to work with youth and I knew that. I didn't know how and then Teach for America kind of found me and I was blessed to work in Dorchester with newcomer students from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and a couple of um, Central American countries as well. And honestly, I always say this, but being Miss Novas is what allowed me to be my best Mariel. And being in that classroom for three years with my students allowed me to see outside of myself really for the first time. Um, obviously I understood my own narrative, my own journey, but to see that sort of magnified through the stories of my students and their families sort of equipped me with a fire that has yet to be extinguished, <laughs> right? Because that's when I started kind of seeing the more systemic nature of what we're facing. And how is it possible that students of mine in 2010, 2012 were experiencing the exact same things that my siblings who came to the US when they were middle schoolers were facing in the 90s. And so that experience is what informed my, my move into uh, my first step into systems work. I became an instructional coach, supported novice teachers all the way from Lawrence to Fall River um, and worked mostly in the city of Lawrence with a lot of our actual homegrown educators. So educators who had been born in Lawrence and now were teaching in Lawrence. And as we all know, Lawrence is a predominantly Dominican, Latino and Dominican community. And so again, seeing that sort of my, my, my capacity to form part of that community and to bring folks together um, was inspirational to me. And so that drove me to think about how can we actually expand this? How can we think about uh, supporting and cultivating our homegrown talent in a way that is actually explicit and like that is the point to bring them in to support us and then to develop our leadership so that we can be the ones leading in the state and so that led me to um, launching our homegrown program at TFA Massachusetts that was sort of a one-stop shop uh, for recruitment retention and leadership development uh, that experience then brought me to think okay so then how do we get that to be the reality across the country. And so I found the, the EDLD program at the Harvard Grad School of Education, the Education Leadership Doctorate Program, which I just completed um, about a, exactly a week ago. <laughs> I graduated a week ago. Um, <laughs> so proud of you. Ay, gracias. Um, and so through those three years was really when I got to deepen my understanding of myself, right? was really the first time that I got to sit with all that this is, right? All my trauma, all the, even, you know, the, the bus rides that have never left me, um, to really understand why and how I am the way I am and what that means in terms of my leadership and what that means in terms of how I wanna grow. And so it's been a really empowering set of three years to this moment and now being here um, sort of unleashed <laughs> and seeing and looking around and seeing the world around me. Um, thinking deeply about not just the role that I play, you know, in our ecosystem, but also the role I play as a human being within my family um, and my community of Boston. Uh, and so that's really what I want to talk about today is really both my healing journey as an educator personally but also the healing of our community and how movement building, um, especially movement building for equity, whether that be in education or other fields, 
is really where we find our power to drive change. And so again, just super excited to be here and excited to talk. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maria Novas. And um, I want now taking all of that that you share with us, that it's so amazingly and openly uh, you share your experience with us. And I, 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 what I can say, just reacting um, briefly to, to what you share uh, in terms of my personal experiences, I can, uh, it resonates with me uh, as also coming from the Dominican Republic as an immigrant. Uh, I came a little bit after you, like I was all, 15 years old and I was a little older, different kind of like perspectives and experiences, but feeling that, um, you know, um, sense of loneliness and not belonging um, and feeling that I was like also plucked out from, uh, you know, my comfort zone and my, my spaces and then kind of like dropped into a completely different, um, you know, um, a structure for me, a space uh, that I, I couldn't find myself for, for a while. So uh, that really deepened as well my sense for creating community and um, in, in ignite a passion at me of uh, working with others and really connecting um, with my most immediate community at that time that was like my neighborhood that was growing up, mostly Dominican as well, um, going kind of like through the same kind of like immigrant experiences, low income uh, community of color. Um, and all of that has really um, shaped the way I see myself as a leader today and, and really shaped my career and my, my trajectory as a professional and, and as, a, as an individual in my growth and my journey. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, you mentioned that in your experience as you, you were finishing your, your uh, program, uh, your PhD program, um, that's where you kind of like confronted all of those things and, and that really informed the way you are today as a leader. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and if you had an aha moment, what, what really, um, you know, what brought you to, to this realization today? Absolutely. Yes, I did have an aha moment. <laughs> um, let me nerd out for a second and share about that experience. So after my first year in my program, um, was that that June or that May was when we started seeing reportajes. Um, how do you say reportajes in English? <laughs> uh, like news about um, yeah. the, separ the, the separations of families at the border. Um, and I was just, and if any of you are on who knew me then, I was wrecked. Um, it was hard to get out of bed. I couldn't understand <laughs> how we could possibly be allowing this to happen. I'm a student of history. I majored in history in, in college and I'm, and I'm also just a nerd. So, you know, learning about history is, is a big part of how I've engaged with the world. And so knowing that this is not new, right? A tool of white supremacy has been to separate black and brown families from slavery to <laughs> internment to what we've done to Native American families. It's, you know, so, and so seeing that happening in 2020 or 2019 or 2018 then, um, I couldn't spiritually sustain that. And so that's when I started to kind of feel like this is going to continue uh, being a thing that I have to kind of engage with, right? Like I can't continue to be laid out in this way, right? I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with depression. It's hard to talk about that. Um, as you saw me kind of open up when I started sharing my remarks, I'm, you know, I'm working on being more honest about where I'm at because it's oppressive to myself when I don't name it. Because instead, you know, me lo trago. I just like swallow it, hold it here, and it becomes, you know, this pressure. And, you know, that wreaks havoc on our health, our mental health and our physical health. And so after that summer, I returned to school and when I tell you, I was just like all up in the divinity school at Harvard, <laughs> um, I was. I knew that my spirit needed restoration. I needed to understand, and I don't mean this through like a religious lens, right? I, I really meant it as like, what is it, what is it about the human condition, about my human condition that I need to understand in order to be my best self, in order to lead in my best way? And so I took a class called um, Trauma and Resilience, How to Empower Those Who Care for Others. And I was, I was not supposed to be led into this class. You needed to take certain prerequisites. You had to have done, like, uh, you had to have uh, a certain set of knowledge about Buddhism. I had none of that. <laughs> but I wrote this professor 
in a, a super long email about like, this is why you really need to let me in this class. And so I was a lot in the class in this seminar. And I can literally say like, there's a before that class and an after that class. Um, and what I really got to get into, the aha moment that I got to, I was reading Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score, which like everyone should read, <laughs> seriously, uh, because it's really the first time that I understood what was happening within my body physiologically, right? How had um, the moments of trauma that frankly I had not identified as traumatic, right? I grew up in Roxbury. Um, you know, I grew up in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. My family, both in DR and here, um, are, are, are low income and we, we you know, we struggle. I, I remembered, you know, in the first few years of us living in the U.S., we would walk down Washington Street in JP and my parents made a game of us like picking out bottles from trash cans in order to change them for like five cents at the store in order to be able to pay for groceries. Right. And so like that was my lived experience. When I think back to that, I, I see joy. Right. And, and I, I don't think about the things that are and were traumatic. And yet the older that I got, the more I started to realize that those things were surfacing. Right. They were they were coming up whether I wanted to or not. And so I had made it. But all of a sudden I was struggling with all this anxiety and depression that I had not struggled with ever before in my life. And so through, you know, through that experience, engaging with my trauma, I got to understand um, the author of that book, and I'm nerding out for real now, but the author of that book makes an analogy to um, in a, a fire alarm and how when you have experienced trauma, you don't hear the fire alarm because the fire alarm is always going off. And when I got that, it had such an impact on me because it's the first time that I understood, oh my God, I've been living in a state of heightened awareness forever, right? I can no longer notice when I'm, when I'm stressed, when I'm relaxed versus when I'm happy versus it's all just kind of happening, right? And therefore I was subject to what was happening external to me instead of feeling like I had control over myself and my emotions and how I was processing information. And so I read that chapter that day, Rosario, and we had to do these reflections afterwards and kind of like talk about, um, you know, what, did, what came up for you, et cetera. And I remember saying like, I, I'm realizing that I can't, I can't distinguish, right? Like I can't sit with my joys and I can't, and I don't know how to sit with, I don't know how to move past the, the hardships in a way that's constructive or healthy, right? And I was writing that thing and I was just like, un mar de lágrimas. I was like, really? I'm broken. Like, <laughs> you know, and that's not, it's not about brokenness, right? Um, and there's a, oh my gosh, I'm totally going to butcher it, but um, I'm sorry that I'm like opening like 10 different windows and thoughts this is how my brain works. But uh, in, in Japan, there's like this beautiful art form that's called, um, it starts with a J, oh my gosh. But essentially it's like, for example, a vase breaks and it shatters and it breaks into different pieces. They use this gold glittery substance, like a glue, it's like cement glue to put it back together to kind of send the message of like the light that shines through the broken places, right? And so I started to see myself as like that vase and my scars as like the things that are beautiful about me and the things that have made me the woman that I am. So as opposed to seeing myself as like this broken thing, I started seeing myself for sort of the healing that those things um, have needed, right? Like the inner child in me that had just like, needs to just be like held a little bit longer. And, you know, and so that's sort of the moment that I, that I really understood that the spiritual component was, uh, and the healing component was central to how I understood the work that needs to happen for us to build the movement that we know we need to build in order to secure justice for our people. So let's, let's take the conversation into that because that, again, you, you just amazing when you, when you put, uh, when you articulate so beautifully your journey. Um, and, and when you talk about healing in that process, um, let's take it into the context of our communities again and what we're facing today and how we are experiencing this trauma 
um, that we have carried that uh, through generations that is now ingrained, I feel like in our, in our beings as, as uh, communities of color, as individuals of colors. Um, so how, can you talk a, a little bit about how the, the um, movement building in communities and what that means historically, what that has been and, uh, and what it is today and, and how us as individuals, uh, the individual level, but also at the community level, how we can take that into our healing process, but continue also um, you know, uh, building a strength to advocate for the change that we want to see in our communities. Mm -hmm. Let me rest a little bit with the first part of your question, because I think it's really pertinent to this conversation within the Latinx community. And I'll start by sharing something that happened on Monday. So Monday, I woke up feeling kind of how I felt this morning, which is like accelerated heart rate, um, a little bit of like the cold sweats and just like, okay, general, just like jitteriness. Um, and was just not feeling great, felt on the verge of tears the whole day, um, and, and was trying to kind of grapple with this idea of when the government turns against its people. And when I sat with that, I was like, oh my gosh, Mariel, like, this is a part of your legacy, right? Like, your people have lived this before, right? This isn't new. In a lot of ways, this lives in my DNA. The reason why I've been so like, right, since 2015, con este hombre, right, <laughs> is because <laughs> he Ew. shall not be named. Um, it's because like, I kind of like felt it in, like, in my body. Like, oh, I have felt this before. This isn't new. And so to see it sort of come to life, um, the only person I wanted to talk to was my grandma. And so, mask on i go to high park and i just lay in my grandma's bed and she just like runs her hand over my legs and i just lose it right and the only thing i wanted to ask her y le, y le pregunté, i was like so my grandma um was a medical doctor in the dr we all call her doctora lovingly and so i was like doctora como tu como tu te hiciste you know bajo trujillo para mantener tu esperanza you know, like, how did you keep your faith? How did you keep going when you were living under dictatorship? You know, like, how, how? And it actually, you know, and this goes back to the trauma. She wasn't able to answer me four times. I had to rephrase the question four times. And every time she answered the question, she would respond with, Papa no cuidaba. Like, Papi would take care of us. Papi would take care of us. And I was like, no, I know, but like, how did you cope? Like, what did you do? in order to like make it through, right? And then she starts telling me about the people she knew who were disappeared, right? Like, el esposo de una amiga, el, el eto y eto. And all of a sudden, and, and like the tortures that would happen in the prisons, in La Cuarenta, in Santo Domingo. And, and I, you know, I'm getting chills right now talking about it because there it was, right? Like, that is my legacy. I do carry that. Um, and she closed by saying kind of like, well, she didn't close. I closed the conversation because I kind of got a sense that like, you know what, like I'm, I'm pushing. Um, and she said, you know, there, there came a point where I couldn't even trust my siblings. I, I didn't even know if I could trust my siblings. And so I, I, I mentioned that because there's a, a, a large amount of familial healing that needs to happen, right? And when we talk about the community part of it, the family units comprise that. And Latinoamericanos, we carry histories that are deeply traumatic, right? I just mentioned the history, you know, in part the history of the Dominican Republic, but we know about the death squads in Central America. We know about, you know, the guerrilla warfare that has happened in, in Colombia. And so this isn't unique to my experience. This is a shared experience throughout the Americas that lives again in the DNA, in the bodies, in the psyches of our people and we are carrying that and yet you know we haven't developed the cultural muscle to center healing in our experiences in large part because you know we come to this country and it's like work 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 para uno superarse but to often to the neglect of our personal well-being 
And then we ask ourselves, I ask myself, how is it that every adult in my family has high blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Every single adult. And then that connects to COVID, right? Our communities have gotten decimated, not just from the economic side, the loss of, you know, the loss of jobs, the loss of wages, but contrale, you know, it's like the, the same historical um, forces that made us be, you know, come here to begin with, to this country, are the same things that are making us be at such a, in such a vulnerable place as a community when something like a pandemic, yet the hombre who has completely turned a blind eye to supporting our people, right? And so it's all connected, which is why for me, you know, I wanted to center this conversation around healing mm -hmm. because if you think about another nerd moment, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And we think about that bottom tier, when your basic needs are not met, right? When you, when you how can you get to self-actualization? <laughs> how can you get to movement building and empowerment when you're just worried about where you're going to sleep, what you're going to eat, like how you're going to breathe? And so I'm very conscious of that, um, which is why I wanted to like stop there for a second, because I don't think we talk about that enough, if ever. I have not sat in a room with other Latinos and Latinas and talked about the histories of our families and what our families have endured you know, to get to this place where we are right now and are enduring, let me say, right? Because I know, I know myself, I still have media familia in Santo Domingo, right? It's not like I'm separate from what they're experiencing there. And so um, I'm on my, let, let me breathe, okay? <laughs> I get, me, me, me pongo. <laughs> um, so that's, the, that's the family piece. Um, and then would you mind rephrasing then the second half of your question around sort of like the more community and sort of movement building side? Espérate que te perdí un momentito. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was just asking if you could rephrase the second half of your question around the more community yeah, building. I just wanted to take that into the context now of our, you know, communities and what we're facing right now, you know, what we just, uh, we talked about it at the beginning. It's like um, all of this disparity and, and, uh, um, and just, just inequity that is happening in our communities, how you just put it again into, into perspective perspective in the sense of how uh, as an uh, immigrant community uh, and as Latinos, we come with all of that already ingrained in our, in our beings. Uh, so how can now, uh, in this space that we are in right now, in the reality that we live in right now with COVID, with, um, you know, with the, um, you know, the disparities that, that we see in, uh, in the Black and Brown communities, uh, with the health issues, with the economic issues that we see, you know, social economic impact in our communities. How can we heal? How can we come together uh, healing as individuals, you know, uh, but also as community? Because again, we are under the Lat Latinos here mm -hmm. in, in the United States. We come in from so many different nations, from so many different countries with, uh, you know, a lot of similarities um, in, in some of the things that we have faced as, as uh, you know, in our own countries, but also with a lot of, um, you know, differences. Uh, depending on where you're coming from, right? But we come here uh, and we are all Latinos, right? Uh, and some of us, um, you know, we are black Latinos. We are, uh, we come also that uh, with that uh, in our, uh, as part of, you know, our labels, but also how we identify ourselves. Um, and and um, all of that kind of like clashes here when we come in. So it's important for us to, to understand that as well. Uh, and I know I'm complicating the question now, but I just want to be able to address all of those things because that's the complication that we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense of coming as, as a community. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to, to ask you the question around, you know, how we can heal together. But if we mm -hmm. cannot come together as, as a community, that's where we should be starting. So I want mm -hmm. you to just comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to pick up on the sort of tail end of your question. And then I think we, this would actually be a great moment to share the poll question um, with folks, because I think that connects to a little bit of my reflection around it. Um, so a lot of the conversations I've been having with my friends right now 
is around the role of the Latinx community in the Black Lives Matter movement. And as a, as a, as a person who walks the world as a Black woman, right? Like, if a policeman pulls me over, he's not going to be like, hey, you D Dominican woman. He's going to be like, oh, she's Black, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a lived reality for a good chunk of us in the Latinx community. And an important aspect of how we walk the world and how we experience this, right? And yet we know that colorism is strong within the Latinx community, right? And again, that connected to the history uh, in large part of struggles in Latin America, right? No es ningún, um, no es secreto, it's not a secret, you know, that Trujillo would use like skin lightening creams in order to be more proximate to whiteness and therefore more proximate to the Spaniards, right? And, and, not, and not to the Haitians. So it's always in contrast to that. Right, and his mission was to really uh, destroy the Haitian community, like really like- Completamente. That, yep. that of the race, right? Yeah, so, we know the, the, the 1937 massacre, right? Like, si puede decir perejil or not, right? Esto, esto era rooted completamente en el racismo, right? And that's not unique to the Dominican Republic. Let me be very clear because I get frustrated when that happens, right? This is rampant. First of all, this is global, <laughs> all right? But this is all over Latin America. And it is something that, in my opinion, is still playing a role in preventing the Latinx community from fully being and standing in solidarity with the Black community of this country, right? And so healing starts with empathy, in my opinion. But empathy starts with self. If you do not know how to express kindness to yourself and how to love yourself, you don't have a practice around it. So you're gonna have a harder time showing kindness and empathy to somebody else, especially given implicit biases that we carry in our heads because, you know, as Dr. Tatum says in Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, we are all breathing in the smog of racism. None of us is exempt from that. Right. And so it's up to us to do sort of the self excavation and like self work to understand how that smog lives out in our lives and how we can sort of work to saca eso para fuera. Right. And so with that, I think we can transition to the, the poll question. This is the question that I wanted to ask the audience, which is, you know, do you currently have a healing practice that you engage with, let's say two to three times a week or more? Right, because this is something for me um, that has been in evolution. So I'll let folks vote and then we'll see what we get. Yeah, and Wendy is going to pull um, that question in the screen if it's not there yet. It's there, yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't get to see it because I'm on the host mode, but um, mm -hmm. let me know when uh, we're just going to give a few more minutes so people can answer. So I'll just say a few words while people are, are, are answering, um, just so you know how my, how my brain works. <laughs> so the way I see this is kind of like Russian dolls, right? Like the, like, la muñequita que tu, you know. <laughs> um, the, like, the littlest Russian doll at the core of it all is you, right? And so when, when we talk about healing, in my, in my mind, it's sort of a practice that radiates out. Um, and that, that has to start with you. Um, and that's going to look different for everybody. But I know for me, um, I didn't grow up with sort of how do you say, um, consistent or regular healing practices. I didn't grow up with meditation or, um, you know, yoga or whatever it may be. Eso no fue parte de mi, de mi, how I was raised. Um, and so I've had to learn those things as an adult and incorporate them into my world, right? Once I was able to at my core, sort of put that into practice, then, you know, the, the Russian doll <laughs> that comes next um, is sort of my, my family unit, right? And so, like, all of a sudden, I'm like, how can I be getting exposure to, you know, this world of information and, and sort of greater access to my, my body and my soul and my mind and not share that <laughs> with the people that I love the most? And frankly, this was the point that is most painful. 
because once you, it's kind of like Plato's allegory of the cave, right? Like once you like see the light and all of a sudden you look around and you see the presence of trauma in your family and how, how we manifest that. And we don't manifest it, to be very blunt, the way white people do on, in the movies, right? Like that's not like, it's not like despondence necessarily, right? It can be irritability. Mm -hmm. anger, lashing out, right? Like hyperactivity, it, it can look really different. So the more I, I got to learn about it, the more I was looking around at my mom, at my dad, mi hermano, and I was like, oh my goodness, right? And so like- Once you know how to recognize it, you cannot see it, right? Exacto, exacto. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden it's like, okay, so how do I express and share empathy with my family and also support them in their healing journey, which is the journey of a lifetime, right? And if you're, you know, my mom is in her 50s, and it, it, it you know, um, for the most part. And then, you know, we've been here for 20 something years. But again, it's like, I'm, I'm like rocking her mind because <laughs> I'm telling her, the, I'm like, mommy, you need to like sit with yourself. And she's like, mira muchacha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, so it's really an education and, and, and patience and a, and a practice. And so, yeah, and, and also, but also, one thing, uh, one thing in our uh, culture too is like we were pain, like enduring pain and, and challenges as a badge of honor. You know, it's like mm -hmm. we recovered from, we, we went through it, and, and, and yeah, so we're strong, you know. It's um, yeah. about pain in a different way and talking about trauma and being, and, and being vulnerable is not something that we welcome, you know, very often mm -hmm. because we, and, and we are here, especially in this country, experiencing the experiences that we are facing uh, to be strong, you know, and to exactly. really, uh, so that's at least what I have experienced uh, with my family and kind of like my, my personal uh, circles, like, you know, just, you know, just, go through it you're strong and you can you can um See. you can go through so mm -hmm. there's not a lot of opportunities and spaces to uh, you know openly talk about the trauma and the pain yep yep mm -hmm. and i and i would and i would include right and i see somebody saying machismo tambien you know mm -hmm. toxic masculinity is real um and in a lot of ways right does not uh, has not allowed a lot of the men in our culture or the the people who identify as men to exist beyond what, you know, they've sort of seen and received the message that they're supposed to be. So that's a limiting factor there. And then when we think about um, often the, the, the people who hold the, the role of the women or the caretaker in our families have been pigeonholed into this sort of like martyr, you know, to kind of what, what you were saying, como que martir. It's like, la mujer sufrida, you know, there's a, there's a little frasecita that Dominicans love, love to use on Mother's Day that like boils my blood. It's like, mujer abnegada. Abnegada, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, so you're telling me, you're praising me for denying myself? Hold up, right? Like there is something there that we really, really need to talk about as a people, right? And so mm -hmm. if we go back to the Russian dolls, <laughs> that's the familial yeah. lens, right? And so like that's, that's that lateral work with like your intimate loved ones. And then we get to the community level, right? So before, before we get to that, Mariel, I want to make sure that you address the, the results of the poll. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also I wanted um, to let you know, like kind of like bring attention to the time so we can Ay, open it. Yo <laughs> yeah. Ay, Dios mío, yo si hablo. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's why we, we invited you. you you've been a... Uh, incredible hey. i wanna like i think you you're gonna have to come back <laughs> we need a <laughs> part part two <laughs> yeah. but, but, so i want i want to make sure that uh, we talk about the results uh, mm -hmm. that you talk a little bit about me and the work that you have uh, been doing with me just briefly um talk about the the movement um you know um conversation and and why is that so important mm -hmm. and, and open it up for um for our, um, you know, um, attendees right now to to be able to ask questions or share any um, reflections to what we've been talking about. 
Okay, I'll be snappy. Okay, if I talk for more than two minutes, I'm yasi. <laughs> so the results kind of mirror what I expected, right? And this is also a self-selected group, right? Folks who, who signed up for this are people who are like, oh, healing, equity, and like, like so, you know, register. And so I would imagine that like, if we actually take like a more general poll in our community, the yes would be lower, the no would be higher, and I don't know where sometimes would land, right? But this reflects exactly my own kind of experience as well. And to and y'all, I hit sometimes, just so that you know. Um, Cause even though I'm like very in it, like from going from intention to action is still a challenge for me. I'm still very much working on it. Um, just being transparent there. And so I really believe sort of like my working theory of action right now in regards to movement building is that we need to get to 100% yes right? Because white supremacy is out here and we are seeing it weaponized through institutions, through systems. And if we are not able, particularly in this moment, when the American government as a structure is going against its own people, right? It's sort of like we have to equip ourselves with the internal fortitude to be able to withstand the headwinds. And the only way that I personally have found that I'm able to stay whole as a person right now is by really developing my inner world and making sure that the strength I carry inside guides me through. Because I'm not going to get that from quien sea, right? And so since this pandemic hit, I've my yoga mat, I, I would move my computer, but the, the rest of my bedroom is not looking great right now. But my yoga mat is just open 100% of the time in my bedroom and I spend time there and I cry there and I like, I'm working on the practice of surrender of just letting go and not trying to control my environment. So thank you all for taking that poll. Um, I bring that lens and that sort of understanding to then the movement building work that I'm doing through the education trust where I work. Through that, I'm, I, I convened the Massachusetts Education Equity Partnership, which is a collection of uh, civil rights, social justice, and education organizations from across the state who come together um, and we really focus explicitly on bringing in direct service organizations, organizations that work directly with historically underserved communities in order to collectively advocate for change through policy, right? Because we see that, you know, we can say all the right things, we can be out here, but until that changes the letter of the law, thank you for going to the next um, slide, you know, we're not going to see the sort of systems wide uh, movement or change that we know we need. And so um, we come together, we have Amplify at the table as well. And a lot of how uh, I think about my work with me is through really intentional and deep relationship building, really intentional um, facilitation of, of, of our work, right, by acknowledging the power that moves between often what keeps us from coming together is we don't acknowledge the sort of um, the, the invisible lines of uh, the invisible barriers that can exist between people, right? When we don't name that, you know, the people who hold the title of president or CEO are the ones dominating the conversation. When we don't name that our younger advocates at the table, right, are not being included as much. So I think about all those things in how we come together because we need all of us in order to build this movement. And until we are very explicit about it, and we've been socialized to be, to feel like certain conversations are taboo, they're not, they're just the reality of, of our life. And so I just put those things right, right on the table and, and welcome people, invite people to engage around them. And so even just yesterday, thank you for pulling this up, Rosario, you know, we were talking about, you know, our, our activism, our advocacy in this moment, and the paralysis that I know a lot of us are feeling when we look out and we're seeing tankers. You know, my best friend Maida, who lives in DC, is here texting me about Black Hawk, you know, flying between buildings. ¿Qué es eso? You know, and so as an individual, how do you feel empowered when the, when the state is being weaponized again, right? And so when I think about a movement, we each have a role to play. And you know, we, the, the roles we see right now are like the role of protester, for example, or the role of you know, legislator. Pero I came across this, um, I was Instagramming late at night, <laughs> and I came across this framework by Deepa Iyer, 
from the Solidarity Is and Building Movement Project, which y'all, like, if you signed up, you'll get it in your email. But uh, if you're looking on Facebook Live, like, look it up, um, mapping our roles in a social change ecosystem, that I think is just awesome because it expands the definition of who, you know, what, what, what work we can do in this. You know, are you a good storyteller? Is that where you derive, you know, life? Tell, tell your story. Tell your story through your Twitter. Tell your story by, you know, writing what you got to say. You know, are you somebody who is a disruptor? Go ahead and disrupt because we need you, right? In this moment, a lot of how I'm seeing myself, unsurprisingly, given the title of the conversation, is as a healer and as a guide, right? Like, I know that given the sort of spaces I've moved through in my life, um, from, you know, El Ensancho Sama in Santo Domingo to Harvard, I'm able to cross between a lot of groups. And I think that, you know, I have the ability to bring folks together. And so, you know, I've been feeling some kind of way that I can't be hitting the streets protesting right now because my grandma is high risk and I can't, you know, I can't risk it. And so I'm like, man, I'm not out there, you know, and feeling that tug because that is, you know, look at my shirt, <laughs> you know, like I would be hitting the streets, um, you know, but finding and identifying for myself a place in the movement has allowed me to feel empowered again and to feel like, okay, yeah, just don't guess it. So yeah. I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing the, the graphic. I, I've seen it around, but um, you know, I, I didn't have a chance before to, to look through it and really taking it in. Um, so this is really helpful. And, um, and what I, I took on from, from what you said, many, many different things, but I wanna highlight intentionality. And I, uh, I wanna highlight like finding your role. Uh, and I wanna highlight uh, when you say surrounding, you know, surrounder yourself kind of, um, you know, in, in, the, in the process of healing. So um, I, we don't have that much time to, to go into more, but like I'm I say- I'm sorry, I everyone. <laughs> oh, I think, no, don't be sorry, please. This has been I wanted to a hear treat, from people. it has been amazing. Yes, so let's open it up for the few minutes that we have left. But before we do that, I do want to thank you, Marielle, uh, for, for just, you know, for being you. It's, it's like, we need, we need this. We need these uh, conversations. We need people like you open to, to share their experiences and as you say, share their stories. Um, uh, we really need more of that. And, um, and, and we wanna thank you for all you have done for our communities so far and all the great things that we know you're gonna be doing. Uh, and we are here to support you and collaborate with you. So let's, let's just keep it going. Amen. Um, and I mean, let's it up for um, others um, here that are joining us. I wanna acknowledge that you are there and that you've been great putting in your comments uh, on the chat. And uh, if you have any questions, any comments, any reactions to um, our talk today, uh, we have a few minutes for that. So uh, Wendy, if you can help me manage that, that would be great. And what you can do is raise your hand uh, by using um, the controls. Or if you have a question that you want me to ask, um, you can put it on the chat. And also, um, I just want to invite everyone um, to find me on social media. Um, so on Twitter, um, at mnovas, mnovas13, uh, I'm marielita1213 on Instagram. You can also uh, email me at my first name dot last name, mariel.novas at gmail.com, or find me on Facebook or LinkedIn. I mean it. Um, it's, it requires all of us. Uh, and if this is work that, you know, makes your heart beat hard, like you're my friend already. <laughs> so let's connect. Um, let's do it. I see Stephanie Burgos has a question. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Maria, for the information that you just provided today. I was a little late on it, but um, I'm going to watch it later on on Facebook. But it was one piece that you was talking about how we have been raised as a as a latinas and and i agree with you 100 percent meditation for us when we're growing up is not part of our education mm -hmm. when we try to i was saying personally for my mom my mom didn't have that my mom only knew to be mom 
to how to do the best she could to bring out to the society a good to kids, educated kids. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you in the, in the aspect that we don't know how to to kind of calm down our emotions to become a little like uh, to close ourselves a little bit to just to think about what is best or how can we become a better person without the noise that is around us. In this case, we have the COVID, we have the, the, the protests right now, and we know that those two things are reasonable for us to be uh, nervous and mm -hmm. angry. But mm -hmm. we also need to understand that we need to take care of ourselves. That's right. And as a mom, it's hard. It's hard to get to that point because we don't have the tools. So I really, really appreciate um, Amplify Latinx to, to bring this type of uh, information to us. And we should be sharing this more to the community because we as a women, we don't have that tool. Mm -hmm. we, we get involved so much in our mother uh, uh, roles and also as, as we are on the community helping other people we forget exactly. that we, have t we need to take time for ourselves. So I really appreciate the information that you have provided today. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, I, again, I've been having this conversation with so many of my girlfriends. It's real. It is real. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and for coming to this space today and, and being open to and to learn and to, and to continue creating community as we want to uh, for this platform to, to be. Uh, we also want to um, make sure that, um, you know, that there's more, uh, you know, we have more programming that we've been um, thinking about and we are scheduling more guest speakers, not only for, for our Cafecito series, but also uh, we, we run a business, a small business resiliency series. Um, so if you have a small business, uh, make sure that you tune into that. Um, we have excellent programming uh, with experts um, in, on those topics. Uh, but we want also to also to make this conversation about taking action uh, and making sure that, um, you know, uh, we follow some of the things that, that we said that we we're going to do. So we call for action. We call for action in, in the sense of, um, you know, make sure that you take care of yourself and find ways of um, healing, like um, Marielle was, was mentioning. Uh, start with something um, that um, can bring you that uh, moment to surround yourself and, and, and really uh, ground uh, yourself in, in, in the moment that you're in. Um, and that's not easy. But, um, you know, especially for those of us that are not used to that, but uh, let's find tools to do that. And we'll share some of those in our thank you. And also um, just, you know, let's continue taking action as members of our totally. communities. And so Marielle, I'm gonna just leave the last word to you. Uh, and with that, we're gonna say goodbye for this afternoon. And we're mm -hmm. gonna um, join us again next week for the next cafecitos but i'll leave the last word to you Marielle. just thank you amplify thank you rosario and mi gente i believe in our power i believe in us our the the stock that we come from is beautiful is resilient um and strong and we need to tap into that and remember that as we move forward because there's plenty trying to literally kill us and beat us down but we've made it through this and worse before. And if we come together, if we heal ourselves, heal our, heal our families and our communities, there is absolutely nothing. And I believe this from the bottom of my heart that can stop us. So for real, let's stand in solidarity together. Uh, reach out to me and I look forward to getting to know some of you outside of this space. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Buenas tardes. <laughs>